This is episode 179 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 179 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Luca Bartella and Sal Galifi on the show. And uh, these guys are go-getters. They're two guys that quit their corporate jobs to start up a wholesaling company. And they just went at it all in and put all their cards on the table. Uh, They're really likable guys, really aggressive business people and real estate investors as well. Um, So I don't think that they need a huge intro. I think that you're going to get a lot out of this one. And just listening to their story and seeing that ambition uh, and seeing what they've been able to accomplish so far, it really does take all the excuses away from all of us. There's a the only thing standing in front of our own success is ourselves. And uh, I really do believe that. And then, of course, these type of interviews uh, reaffirm that belief. So just before we jump in, as always, I want to mention to you that going right back to the beginning of this podcast is a great strategy if you're new to real estate investing and you want to pick up all those gold nuggets and get the fundamentals down. We've had a lot of great guests on the show and they've shared their stories Uh, starting back in 2019. And again, I'll ask you to just kindly take a moment and rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts if you haven't done so yet. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like, subscribe and notification bell and leave a comment just to help more people find the show. Uh, That'd be greatly appreciated. So without further ado, let's jump into episode 179 with Luca Bartella and Sal Galifi. Hello and welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. I have Luca Bartella and Sal, give me your last name. Delifi. Delifi. All right, there we go. All right, guys, uh, came all the way down from Woodbridge, right? Woodbridge, yeah. That's it. Okay, well, uh, yeah, thanks for making the trek. Um, first off, would you be able to just tell me a little bit about your background, guys? Yeah, for sure. So pretty similar background in terms of getting into real estate. Um, we both started out by buying a condo each in Toronto rented it out uh, back when you could actually cash flow on a condo in Toronto. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, we still, we were both in business school at uh, Schulich at York and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, brainwashed that, you know, you got to go down the corporate path, right? Whether it's investment banking um, or something like that. And, you know, while we were at Schulich, we surprisingly had a few courses that were in real estate. Um, one was development, one was finance. Uh, actually both taught by real estate developers in the GTA. So it's pretty interesting. That kind of gave us some exposure and kind of made us think, um, do we want to do corporate? Do, do we want to do real estate? Um, we did, you know, end up going in, both going into corporate jobs. Uh, but while we were there, you know, like a lot of other real estate investors kind of realized it wasn't really what we wanted to, to do. And the first thing we did to kind of jump into real estate was we did a flip in Oshawa. Um, you know, that was kind of our first whack at it. We did a lot of the work ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, you know, barely scraped out any profit out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maybe made a few thousand dollars each. And, you know, what we realized is that even though we really saved on the cost, did a lot of the construction work ourselves, um, still again, couldn't make too much of a profit. And we realized that, uh, profit really comes from the buy, right? You have to buy. Yeah. And we realized we overpaid on the buy. So, you know. It was tough, it was yeah. tough to squeeze out a pro- profit. And that kind of led us to looking at, you know, how can we find these properties at a better price? You know, what's the strategy here to actually make a profit on a flip? And Sal actually stumbled on um, real wholesale. estate wholesale, yeah. right? I think it was some content from the States and, you know, started doing that part time while we were still at our corporate jobs, realized like, you know, there's a lot of potential here to make some good money. And then I think by, you know, beginning of 2020, we kind of jumped in um, full time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You guys are unique in that you came from business school and sort of let it all go to go down the real estate path. Like that's not that common, right? I mean, similar path for me, right? Uh, although not the wholesaling side of things. So, so chronologically your first flip was 2019, 2018, 2018. When did you guys graduate? We bought before, uh, we bought our condos. He bought it, I think 2014, just a simple, you know, investment condo, just hold rental. Mm -hmm. Um, I bought mine in 2016 didn't do much for a couple of years. And then in 2018, we decided to do a flip. Okay. And, uh, you know, that kind of didn't go as well as we planned. And then 2019, yeah. we kind of jumped full force into, uh, into wholesaling. Yeah. What were you guys doing for full-time jobs out of school? So I was working at a real estate development finance firm. Okay. It was a pension fund. We were um, financing developments across Canada and the U.S. Okay. And uh, he was at uh, RBC yeah, doing uh, just finance. Yeah, just 
Okay, so you're both in sort of helpful fields to, to know your numbers Some and, way, yeah. and finance, yeah. Um, okay, so then you made the decision at what point, like what was the catalyst where you said, yeah, we can we can leave these jobs and, and go full steam into our own endeavor? I think so we started running some Google ads right at the beginning of 2019 um, and also sending out some mail. And then we tied up a couple deals within like the first few months. One yeah. we decided to keep as a flip and the other ones we decided to wholesale. And we saw based on the fees and the projected profit of the flip that our, our, um, we're better off probably going full time into the business mm -hmm. than, than yeah. continuing at our, our regular jobs. And did you have like a little bit of money saved up just for, you know, obviously deals take a while to close yeah. sometimes yeah. you gotta. Yeah. So we were able to save some, you know, from the, through the corporate job, but also those condos that we bought, you know, let's call it 2014, 2015, we did end up selling them and kind of injecting that capital into the business. Yeah. So that was a huge help. Now tell me about like the initial early, you know, deal negotiations when you guys were finding properties your first time. I mean, I'm sure that didn't go as smoothly as it's uh, sure not, gone yeah. into. Yeah. So tell me about that <laughs> yeah. first conversation and how that went. Yeah, we were we were taking calls like in the middle of, of work hours. <laughs> we would like step out yeah. from our work jobs and, and take some calls as some leads came in. And, you know, we weren't as familiar with the sales process, um, but we ended up kind of just really diving headfirst into uh, learning how to become good at sales, especially for negotiating off market deals a lot of, you know, YouTube university yeah. and just slowly over time, we kind of got better. Yeah. I mean, that was one of those things I struggled with a little bit, like being hard negotiating on, on the people I was, cause I felt sympathy for them. Like I didn't want to yeah. tell them the number that I had to, had to get it for. Although I should have, I thought they'd just shoot me out of their house. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which happened. Which does happen. happen. You know? yeah, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So walk me through like your typical like approach if you're if you're kind of sitting down and talking to somebody like how do you make it a win-win like you're trying to make it a win for them they don't want to you know they probably don't want people or they don't want to list their house you know how do you put it or you know how what do you find works in terms of an approach with with people you talk to for sure so i mean typically the people that reach out to us or at least the people that um we can make a win win their number one priority typically is in price yeah. Right. So someone's number one priority is price. Um, they're not in a rush. Their house is in great yeah. condition. We honestly tell them, like, you're probably better off listing it. Listing, you're going to yeah. make more. Because yeah, you don't want to waste your money yeah. or your time going and seeing those. Right. Exactly. And how many calls do you get like that? Like people just fishing to see if you might pay more than their probably 90, 95 percent of the calls. <laughs> yeah. Get. So do you just yeah. weed them all out and just we, we kind of weed them out? Yeah. We put them through the sales process. Yeah. And uh, we yeah. kind of determine, I'd say in a 15 to 20 minute call yeah. that uh, that they're probably not best suited for. Yeah selling private. So you have like a list of questions that have a they list get of asked. Questions, yeah, like, yeah. have you already spoken with a realtor? Why exactly, are you not exactly, listing with yeah. a realtor? Oh, because um, we don't want to pay the commission. Okay. You're not a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it's going into motivation. So, um, timeline, why don't you want to list with a yeah. realtor? Um, and then going into price expectations so, and what they're, what they want to get for the place. Right. And are, do you find they're forthcoming with that typically when you're talking to people? Not all the time, but yeah. uh, we have different tactics to, you know, get the price Disarm. out of them. Yeah. Yeah, kind yeah. of try and build a little rapport with them. Exactly, yeah. And you have like an actual company, like branded company for your wholesaling, right? Yeah, correct. So that probably helps like with a little bit of like legitimacy. Bit, yeah. yeah, we yeah. have some reviews. Like a lot of the, the sellers will either, you know, straight away go to Google to try to see some reviews or go on uh, the Better yeah. Business Bureau. Okay, are you on Better Business Bureau? And we're Bureau? there as well, yeah. Yeah, that's actually key that's really smart of you guys to do that. Yeah. And then Google reviews, what do you just like offer them a little kickback if they give you a review or? Well, we have been so far, but that's a good idea for sure. <laughs> I would definitely say like, you know, an extra 250 bucks uh, in a gift cards if you leave us a review or something. I don't know if you can do that according to Google. They probably don't like that, but yeah, yeah. I mean, that would help a lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And say if we really like your review, it's 300 bucks. Because <laughs> <laughs> then they don't just say, oh, here, I left a review. <laughs> yeah, You'd be, I don't know. It's, it's hit or miss. Some of them are, you know, ecstatic to, to leave a review. And, you know, yeah. some of them just, I guess, don't get around to it. Well, I, okay, so I could see a logical reason why they wouldn't want to, because a lot of them, the motivation to sell with you would be discretion. Like they don't want their, mm -hmm. they don't want to be known to be yeah. selling their house. They want to fly under the radar. So then why would they want to publicly talk about it? Yeah. So that's going to be hard. You're going to have a, probably an easier time with people who just were in a pinch timing wise and you came in and helped them out or something. Yeah. I don't know. What do, what do you find is like the main motivations of people who want to sell? I think it varies, but surprisingly um well given you know because of covid a lot of it was you know i don't want a bunch of showings i don't want too many people in my house but a lot of the times we find it's it's actually laziness yeah right don't want to you know even just clean up and declutter 
right? Yeah. They just want it yeah. done. Okay, yeah. so those or people embarrassment. Might, yeah, those people yeah. might leave your review. That no one came through their house to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people are embarrassed of if they have a especially distressed property, yeah. having people come through it. Yeah. So do you guys still go out and see properties now, or do you have a team that does that for you? Yeah, so we hired, um, our first hire was uh, what we call lead intake manager. So they're taking the initial call. Mm -hmm. And you know, like we just spoke about, having those initial questions to screen the seller, whether they are best suited for our service. And we hired for that last June. Okay. And then towards the fall, we brought in a home buying specialist, you know, got them trained throughout the end of 2021. And starting this year, they were going on appointments themselves. Okay. So out of your 95% that you, you'd say are, have the wrong motivations, are you still seeing some of those houses before you figure it out? Like or, us personally? Yeah. Do you guys actually, uh, you know, you fail to screen them out beforehand? Um, so us personally, we don't go on appointments anymore. Not anymore? Okay. Not anymore. We send just our home buying specialist. Okay. And we have three, three leading intake managers and okay. uh and one disposition manager now so when we tie up the deals okay. and we sell them she yeah. deals with all the buyers okay and where did you learn this structure of business like that's that's fairly similar from other wholesaling businesses yeah. that i've heard so yeah. did you guys kind of like monitor best practices or you had some like did you do coaching at all um were you just kind of looking at youtube university yeah <laughs> surprisingly we kind of did it basically yeah. all youtube and, and yeah. our own kind of research we looked at different yeah. potential coaching yeah opportunities and, and none of them really stood out to us and we kind of just figured you know yeah. we'll uh we'll kind of fail our way through it and figure it out that yeah. way yeah i mean the worst that's going to happen is you're going to waste some money on advertising right you're not yeah. going to be as effective as you wanted to be did you have an initial like earlier success that really showed you that this is uh this is something like we've got something here it's worth hiring people it's worth building out this business yeah i think it was a slow start i would say it took maybe four months four or five months to get you know, a decent deal. And we actually had to co wholesale that with another company because we didn't have a buyer's list at the time. Yeah. But it was, it was still, even after splitting it, it was a decent enough fee that it covered all the costs for the past four months. Okay. So we're like, okay, you know, we got we, something, we got something here. We just have to learn, refine it and, and grow it. Yeah. And then, so then at that point you started building a buyer's list. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Just like, uh, like, is it, a, is it how, like how segmented is your list? Is it one generalized list or yeah. you got a list for every, it's just list. all yeah. yeah. You don't everyone have a Vaughn list. <laughs> no, everyone gets funneled into one list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you it's got, just, I don't know, just logistically, it, it doesn't yeah. make sense to kind of split it. No, up. I know like multiple mailing lists yeah. is like so tedious. Yeah. So what, um, look, what's your geographic area of focus? For that business for purchasing properties yeah um so throughout the gta southern ontario yeah. we go as far north as sudbury oh, we wow. have done a couple of deals in timmins too yeah. um and then east east how far do we go maybe bowmanville, uh, bowmanville peterborough yeah, okay. that type of area and then west uh west the farthest we've gone is uh ingersoll yeah ingersoll. or wellens or Southwest. wellens yeah you got it long. okay yeah. so as far as your advertising strategies and, and putting out um, marketing materials, you have somebody that handles that for you now? Yeah, or, we, you we still, still kind of oversee a lot of the marketing. Yeah, but so you kind of say, we, we want to do these areas yeah. and here's how to set it so, up. Yeah, at the beginning, we were managing the Google ads ourselves. So that was mm -hmm. the one one kind of program that we went into. We bought like this uh, this course, it was like a $2,000 course. On optimizing on, Google on ads. On optimizing Google ads and I was running it all ourselves. Yeah. And then we ended up switching over to hiring that company and now they fully yeah. they fully manage our, our Google ads. Oh, interesting. And then, uh, and then we send out mail. So what does that agreement look like uh, for the Google ads? Because I think a lot of people shy away from them because Google ads are so expensive. Yeah. yeah. But your agreement with this company, like did was what you learned from them helpful enough to get the cost down, the cost of acquisition It down? was, it, 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 they had a very good program. It just got to the point that uh, we wanted, or at least both of us wanted to focus on growing the business mm -hmm. more instead of kind of being in the weeds of it. Because yeah. it, it took a lot of time just to manage the Google ads and try to optimize it. Oh yeah. That I we bet. said, you know, we gotta just pass this off to yeah. to them to handle. So what kind of, is it a is it a per click kind of price they charge you or is it a flat so the, fee? So the Google ads fee is separate. It's yeah. whatever we, we pay per click. Right, right, but I mean to this Their company. management fee is just a flat fee. So yeah. even if we increase, what we liked about their model was the you the price of the fee yeah it doesn't increase if we if we increase the google ads budget infinitely yeah. their fee doesn't increase it's not a percentage yeah. of the google ads budget 
and I'm guessing you guys are getting into some pretty big spend on for sure, on yeah, yeah. Run, like thousands <laughs> and thousands yeah. uh, a week kind of thing. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah, over it's ten thousand a month. Over ten thousand a month, yeah. And then this company, like, what can you give me an idea of, like, what's reasonable to pay for that? Like, I'm I'm not even thinking just for this business. I'm thinking for something on yeah. here too. They're based out of the U.S. I think we pay them seventeen fifty USD a month. A month. Okay. Um, they also manage our SEO, so that's for another an added fee, right? Yeah. For, yeah, for an additional fee. So yeah. that's another component of kind of yeah. running online ads. And you had to like sign on for them, like a longer sign term on. contract. Uh, I think it was a six month contract. Yeah, six month contract, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's something like I mean, for our campground, we want to like optimize. I'm just not sure if we need to spend that uh, for yeah. the campground. Yeah, I don't but know. I, I definitely want to like learn how to how to get that um, better optimized so that we're capturing all the traffic. Well, I personally don't want to, but I want somebody who's working for us to. <laughs> what we liked about this company was they were their specific niche is yeah. real estate investment. So yeah. they're not like a generalized yeah. kind of Google ads management. So they help people find wholesaling. They, they, that's all they do. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. How'd you find them? I guess just, I think searching online. So the, the website yeah. provider that we found, mm -hmm. they kind of had links or referrals. And I think they were one of the referrals mm -hmm. stumbled across them. And then, uh, Interesting. We went with them, yeah. Yeah. I think we spoke to a few, but like Sal said, everyone else, um, their fee grew mm -hmm. with your budget. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't really make sense knowing that at some point we you would have a pretty scale. large budget. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you guys notice like implementing their strategies, you saved a lot of money. Like, yeah. You well, we, we kind of used their strategy right from the beginning. Right. From the beginning. right? Okay. So that's what we use their strategy. We had success ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're like, we might as well go with them because yeah. we trust that they're going to do a good job. Okay. Yeah. So and you didn't want to hire somebody and like bring them internal. I guess it's it cheaper to hire sense. these yeah. guys. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that was the that was the decision, right? Do you hire like a marketing manager that mm -hmm. can do, you know, Google Ads, SEO, maybe social media? Yeah. Or do you contract that out? And I think it mm -hmm. came down to yes, cost, but also expertise. Like Sal yeah. said, it's yeah, you, you know, want the expertise because you'd if you wanted something really good, they're going to cost you a lot more than seventeen hundred a month exactly. as an employee, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, I always lean towards I want people to work for me full time because I don't want their attention anywhere else. I want, yeah, which I know mean, you guys are hiring a ton, right? We've talked about that a little while back. Um, you know, you're growing pretty aggressively. Yeah. Um, are you? I'm guessing like you know, it's not as it's not as common to have subcontractors in your line of work. You're you're really building a direct team, correct? So yeah, I would say that the main subs are marketing. So like uh, yeah, they're your like marketing. we're saying Google yeah. Ads, SEO. Yeah, and now we've also subcontracted some social media. Okay. All right. And then what else? I think you guys had some construction side of your business. You're also doing that. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we're, uh, so part of our business is, is flipping these properties. We don't wholesale every single property. Mm -hmm. We also have a rental portfolio. So what we decided at the beginning of this year was to bring construction in house. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a third business partner, Giacomo, mm -hmm. and he's also an agent. He lists some of our properties, but he also manages, um, the construction side. Yeah. So we hired uh, four full-time laborers. Okay. Basically, just a generalized uh, carpentry experience. They can kind of yeah. do uh, the floors, the trim, doors, paint, that type yeah. of stuff. And so more finished carpenters than rough fin carpenters. More finished carpenters. Some of them can do some plumbing work. Yeah. Um, but we'll we'll typically sub out the electrical yeah. roof and the kitchens. Yeah. Okay, electrical roof kitchens. Okay, and that's a that's a sweet spot to be in. And I know we we talked about this uh, at length earlier. And I'm I'm super intrigued by what you've done. So. Give me, give me the report. So what, what did you get into in terms of the employees that you hired? Um, what's the quality of these hires? Are they, you know, AAA <laughs> performers? Are they people that, that have a lot of potential and you're kind of working with and, and, and growing together? So yeah. far, they're, they're pretty good. You're saying on the construction side? Yeah, like the, the hires that you've had yeah. on the construction side. Yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty good. Some of them are older, so they have a lot of experience. Yeah. Um, we actually, we hired one person and then he ended up quitting right away yeah. after like a week or two. But, yeah. but the other three have been pretty committed so far. And they're all like, are any of these like just general labor or are they all like semi-skilled or They're skilled? all semi-skilled. Okay. Yeah. So no like journeyman carpenters in there, but they're all like people who can they're all, they, handle yeah. the tools. Yeah. Yeah. We actually, um, just to uh, circle back, we actually did have one guy that was more of a journeyman carpenter mm -hmm. and he didn't really fit in yeah. with the team. He, he said he was able to do a lot of the work that he wasn't yeah. actually able to do. And we, we had to unfortunately let him go. Yeah, I'm just curious, like, because I think sometimes I even overcomplicate this in my head to think, like, what's it going to cost to get somebody that's really good? Because, like, I, at this point, I really want a full-time journeyman carpenter on my on my site down in Sarnia. Uh, because we just, we end up hiring too much out. Like, we just need somebody there pretty much all the time. Um, so what's a reasonable expectation? I guess you're getting, like, semi-skilled. What's the yeah. hourly rate that you're getting into for these workers? Uh, we're paying them a 3750. 3750. I think one of them makes... 
Uh, yeah, I think they all make thirty seven fifty. Yeah. Thirty seven fifty. Okay, so they're making a good wage. So, and, and you find that they're effective. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. pretty okay. good. Yeah. And you have enough work to keep them busy full time. Yeah. yeah. As of now, we're we're pretty busy. Yeah. We're yeah. actually backed up. Yeah. Yeah. How many? How many? Okay. So next question is: Are they able to handle like the full scope of work of everything you're buying at this point? I mean, aside from like you said, kitchen and and uh, roof. And yeah. What else? Yeah. Yeah. And electrical. Electrical. Yeah. Just because you need ESA. You're supposed to have ESA. That. Yeah. Right. But yeah, they they've handled everything. Um, the most complex thing we've done so far with them is uh, duplex conversion. Okay. Um, so we have Jack Mole, our partner. He's on site pretty much every day. He's dealing with the inspector. Yeah. Um, so he they're kind of following his direction there. Mm -hmm. But I'd say in terms of the actual work, you know, haven't seen any issues. Quality's been good. Okay. Um, we'll see the next you know, kind of step we're taking is, um, we're currently waiting for permits for a coach house in Barrie. Okay. So that's maybe a little bit more complex. We'll see how that goes. And then, yeah, take it from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have to fill in some gaps, big deal. Yeah. So uh, how many projects did you say you total are, are operational right now? Right now, probably five. Five in but construction. one of them is in Sudbury, so it's actually GC. Yeah. You, you, yeah. That yeah how far can you really send these guys, yeah. right? Do you send them like within an hour? The farthest is an hour and a half. Yeah. So they go out to Ingersoll. They're all kind of in the Vaughn, Woodbridge yeah, area. Yeah. They go out to Ingersoll, but they complain a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, like, I guess you're paying their mileage to get to the site. Yeah, yeah. So part of their compensation, we do, we do give them a gas card. Yeah. So, they, uh, so a lot of their, their gas travel to uh, sites is covered. Oh, okay. To go yeah. to sites. Yeah. So so rather than give them kilometers, you just pay for the gas. Yeah. Yeah. That's cheaper. That's a smart idea. Well, yeah. If, if they'll go for that, that's great. Yeah. 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 I got to start trying that one. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can monitor it too. Yeah, you yeah. can. Right. So is it, is it just like a credit card that they can yeah, swipe for Yeah, it's a credit card with a limit. Yeah. It has a limit on it. and That's smart. Yeah. So sort of tangent, but on this credit card, who are you guys using for your business credit cards? Because I find this kind of a frustrating thing. So we originally had all our business banking with Scotia. Yeah. Now we just got a Amex Platinum, um, which is great for points. Haven't had any issues and it's, yeah. it's a dynamic balance. Yeah. So as you spend more, your limit grows. So especially on the wholesaling side with these, you know, high marketing yeah. costs, it's, yeah. you know, made things a little bit more simple. You don't have to pay it off as. And that's not a personal card. That's a corporate card. That's a corporate card. Yeah. Yeah. I need to make a switch because RBC is like, so they started out well and, and they gave me, you know, $20,000 cards for all my companies with no personal credit credit reporting so they weren't reporting to my personal credit yeah and the last one they gave us like a measly ten thousand, and it shows up on my personal credit oh, so i'm shit. like that's not gonna work yeah. <laughs> getting rid of that <laughs> like i don't mind the personal guarantee but if it reports to my credit bureau it affects everything i do yeah. right yeah and you don't want that with your like businesses so. yeah um interesting to know okay so amex what's it called amex platinum Platinum. Okay. So I don't know, there's a bunch of like travel benefits. There's all these benefits. Yeah. I don't know, you know, how much we'll use them, but yeah. yeah the only thing is, like, some people don't want to take Amex, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's a little yeah. bit frustrating. So we always have to have a second credit card. Yeah. Yeah, and that one's like a personal one, hopefully, or hopefully that yeah. one's the Scotia. Oh, okay. still corporate. The other thing yeah. too, I think we were on our Scotia card was a cashback, okay. and I think we were getting taxed on that. And now we're yeah. going to try to switch over to a point system. Yeah. That, so there's no. Yeah, like, I've heard like. I've heard the CRA crack down on that, the cash backs, like they wanted to yeah, like, yeah, tax just, people on it. Yeah, tax the highest rate. So. Yeah, so you don't want to, yeah, just ideally don't yeah. get into Try that. Try to use the travel towards uh, the business. You know, yeah. Like, take a trip, you're going to go look business at some properties. Related. Yeah, yeah. 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 go look at a couple of properties or, you know, like near a beach or something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Okay, so the business is growing for you guys. Uh, you've got a good team. Have you noticed since, like, tell me about the big differences you've noticed since you brought on these four guys to, to work inside your business rather than general contracting stuff out? So uh, cheaper, obviously. You, know, you are like, noticing it's cheaper? Yeah, definitely okay. cheaper. And the other thing that I, I was kind of surprised of is they're like, there's more accountability where I thought there'd be less. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know, our initial conversation with, with different people that, um, you know, had laborers as employees is like you know this guy doesn't show up today or he quits tomorrow and we've just found you know a good amount of consistency whereas sometimes yeah. with subcontractors before or general contractors they're like oh you know i'm i'm off your site this week because i'm on another site oh yeah that yeah, drives me nuts time, yeah. right that drives me nuts um yeah i think i told you guys like i used to be able to do like an addition close it in have it move in ready i think the quickest we did it was two and a half months like, how could you ever do that time frame yeah. Like, yeah. With, with subcontractors or like a general contractor? Yeah. You just never would. Even like, 
even me general contracting stuff myself, if I'm hiring like a separate plumbing company, separate electric company, drywall company, like they all have a little lead time. They all like, they'll tell you three weeks for drywall when I know if you're really pushing, you can do it faster. You can hang the drywall on a couple of days and then you can just yeah. tape for the, you know, for technically the quickest I've ever really seen is like a week and a half. For taping? Taping, yeah. yeah. And that's quick, right? Like yeah. They'll tell you they can do it in five days or whatever. Like, yeah. I've never seen it. <laughs> we find our guys that aren't as enthusiastic yeah. to do the taping. Yeah, yeah so that's a real... subbing that out. It's too. a real art. Yeah. yeah. And so finding somebody who can do it quick is kind of rare. Like, they'll... I don't know what it is, but they're just like, for some reason... I, dry time. They'll always blame it on dry time. I'm like, well, did you set up the dehumidifier? <laughs> <laughs> did you turn the heater on? Um so anyways, yeah, back to uh, to your sort of system. So you're saving saving costs. You're getting a little faster. Is that true? Like faster as well? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, yeah. I think because we have, you know, let's say four projects on the go that we're managing ourselves mm -hmm. because you're, you're jumping from because site you're to moving site. Them around. You feel like it's taking longer. That's hard. Yeah. But my guess is if you had, you yeah. know, one GC doing all four sites, be taking a lot longer a lot that. longer yeah i think so too but it's almost like you need to get a few more employees if you're going to have this many yeah. sites yeah <laughs> it sounds like, seems yeah. like you guys have already outgrown your team yeah, yeah. what's well, always managing what we have in the pipeline too yeah because you don't, don't want to over hire right yeah yeah because yeah. we were we were forecasting a, a patch of let's say two three weeks that we had no work and yeah. we had to rush to buy a deal and close it in a week you know just yeah. to keep just them busy, busy. Yeah. that's the one thing that, yeah, it's really tough about hiring on. Now you could lay them off for a few weeks, but or tell them take your vacation now because yeah. you're not going to be able to take it later. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough to take that risk, though. They might find another job. It, it is hard. So yeah. maybe you, you give them a little bit of a vacation gift card and say, "Go on vacation now." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I find like the summer is when people want to take vacation, but that's the time construction. Yeah, is always like. It's not that you should necessarily be busiest, but you can be more productive in the summer when the weather conditions are good. Mm -hmm. Not when they're scorching hot, but when it's dry, you, you know, foundations can be dug a lot easier, things like that. So anyways, okay. So what are the plans going forward though, though now? Like, are you planning to grow bigger, keep it the same? Obviously the market and what's going on is maybe impacting your business decisions. Tell me about the outlook. Yeah, so I think, I think um, the goal is always to grow, right? It's kind yeah. of grow or die. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, of course, the, the market's kind of throwing a wrench in that a little bit. So maybe the growth is not as quickly, but the goal is still to continue growing both sides of the business, the construction team and the sales or office team. I think on the construction side, the next step is probably to get a site super. Mm -hmm. Just so Jack, you know, Giacomo can't be on every yeah. site every day, especially if, you know, one's in Welland, one's in Barrie, mm -hmm. one's in, let's say, Oshawa. Yeah. Right. So that's probably the next step there. And then on the on the office side, the two next hires will probably be one and admin uh, just to take, you know, some yeah. of the, the mundane tasks uh, off everyone's he hands, kind of yeah. create some more efficiency. And then I think the next step would be to hire a sales manager, kind of manage that manage and grow that sales team. Yeah. Yeah. Right now we're doing all the sales management. And it's time to kind of pass that off. Okay. Now, when you're talking about this, you're talking about the like offloading your properties, like the ones you're selling. Or no, sorry. No. When I say when I mean sales, like when we refer to the sales team, that's the people talk, the employees talking to the sellers. Oh, okay. So your wholesale yeah. lead gen. And exactly. Wholesale lead gen. Yeah. 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 So you already do have somebody that goes out, but you guys are still doing like the intake. Yeah. So yeah, we all or the all the intake it. comes through us. Mm -hmm. We get probably about 200, 300 calls um, or leads a month. So there's okay. so we need a lot of staff to kind of manage all those and leads. And get back to every single and get one. Back to everyone Are you in trying to like that? get these people right when they call? Right away. Yeah. 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 So you're so somebody are, is it one of you guys that are answering the phone? No, we're not we're not answering. So that's why we anymore. have we have three lead intake three managers lead intake. full okay. time. Okay. So they fully they take yeah. all the calls, all the leads yeah. that come in, and then we have one uh, home buying specialist so that yeah. when the lead is considered yeah. qualified, right. we pass it off to the home buying yeah. specialist. He goes to the appointment mm -hmm. and he signs the deal. Okay. So you're just overseeing that and stuff we're right overseeing now, that, yeah. and you want to delegate that part too. Yeah. Okay, and then grow that side of the business more and too. And grow that side of the business, yeah. What are your thoughts now on kind of the current market with interest rates being increased and sort of a lot of people seem to be doing the wait and see model? Are you seeing that in your business at all now, or still are things still moving? And you know, how are you managing that? Yeah, so I think on the seller side, the type of lead has has changed somewhat. So we're getting more people that are listed 
and you know which is which is okay right if if they're listed but you know they're willing to sell at a discount you know at a price that makes our numbers work okay great mm -hmm. the challenge is that they're still looking for february march prices when number one the markets come down and number two you know we still can't pay market value and and turn a mm -hmm. profit so it's a bit of a, a challenge there right and when majority of the leads are like that it's hard to sign as many deals yeah. or as many quality deals. But aren't they, aren't, aren't your majority of leads always like that? Majority of our leads are like that, but majority of the the leads that we actually sign are yeah. not like that. Yeah. So we're kind of missing those So the quality sellers. of leads have, has gone down a little exactly. bit recently. Exactly. Yeah. And then on the opposite side, so obviously, you know, we're not keeping every property for ourselves. On the disposition side to other buyers, like you just said, you know, some of these buyers are kind of wait and see. So we've seen less interest mm -hmm. in each deal. Yeah, but still moving just a little slower. Still moving still just moving, a bit yeah. slower, yeah. I think certain properties are, are harder to move. So, yeah. you know, if it's, let's say a million dollar property in, in Toronto, Scarborough, even like Pickering, um, that's a lot harder to move than, you know, a $500,000 property in, in Brantford or, you know, even yeah. a Hamilton, lower price stock, yeah, in yeah. Hamilton. Okay, so it's the lower price stuff people are still yeah. on. What do you make of all this? Like, where do you see things going as far as like, I mean, obviously it seems like there's another rate hike coming. And mm -hmm. I think that's what most people are afraid of. I think yeah. that's where a lot of the wait and see comes from. Um, do you think that this is something that is going to be a longer trend or you think this is going to be a reversal? I think the government goes until something breaks. Yeah. They're going to keep increasing rates. And then at yeah. some point they, they might have to reverse course. I think like personally, I think recessions like, like, almost like tough to debate that that it wouldn't be a thing like yeah i think we might already be it's in inevitable yeah. yeah i think yeah. we are in one right yeah. now because I, like before we were basically like six percent economic growth but you know six percent inflation so yeah. <laughs> you know so it was basically nil and now we're going to increase interest rates and, and drop our growth so so if we are in a recession yeah like i wonder if they change course i think like it's all but certain that they're going to raise it again but the damage will be already quite catastrophic mm -hmm. just yeah. based on how much debt people have yeah and, and what it does to the market. But I don't, I personally don't think that's enough to control the inflation. So what do they do? So you don't that, see right? inflation coming down at all? It could come down. Um, it's, I think there's two things to consider because inflation is not this thing that will just keep going forever. If they mm -hmm. stop printing money, it will yeah. eventually fizzle. Yeah. Like they don't even need to change the rates. Eventually it will fizzle. But if they keep printing money, then well, then we're going to continue to have a problem. Really what they should do is just stop printing money. And then, <laughs> you know, I, can, I know they can't take it back. Yeah. They can't, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. But uh, so it's, it's a question of that. I mean, now we have this, um, you know, NDP liberal government that, you know, the spending is probably going to continue and at a ridiculous rate. So tough to say, tough to say what's going to happen. Are they going to just conclude that we need to live with inflation? I, um, I, in a way, I think that would be one of the better case scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then in a way that's really not good, right? Because that's just going to keep things going, going up. So. Either way, this has got people a little spooked, yeah. what, what's happened now, because they realize, okay, rates could go up again. Um, so what would you do if the climate stays similar as it is right now? Like, how would you guys adjust? We'd probably continue to, to do the same thing we're doing right now. We're just, we're always focusing on buying discounted properties. Yeah, so just buy for a better if deal. If we're buying, yeah, we just have to factor that in. Yeah. We, yeah. we might factor into our numbers now, especially as we're buying these deals. Before we used to think, you know, prices might increase so mm -hmm. we can, you know, be a little bit more aggressive. Now we're being, you know, extra conservative because we might factor in a five yeah. to 10% decrease. Decrease in the end value. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you just build it in, okay, we're expecting the price to decrease, we'll be fast. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a heck of a, that's a heck of a game to play because a lot of people are too afraid to play that game and you can still do well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's probably how I would want to handle that. I mean, at, at a logical level, I mean, emotionally, I think people are like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that feels yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a bit worrisome it, for some deals that come across our, our table that uh, they want a long closing for whatever reason, because we give them that flexibility. Mm -hmm. We really have to factor that. And if they want the deal to close in August, September, we don't know exactly where prices are going to be. They might be yeah, lower. So you right? have to give them an even, even further discount. Yeah. yeah. And that's, hey, that's smart. It makes sense to just like cover your basis uh, as far as that goes. And um, you might actually find some incredible deals right now. With everybody feeling like this, you're going to have a few people that need to sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're going to be their best option. So I know you're saying the leads are a little not great right now, but I feel like they're going to get really good For sure. yeah. in, in the near future if this continues because people will just be like, well, I need to sell this. What can you do for me? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, you know, 
obviously we we're we're in the weeds of it and being real estate investors um but i think it hasn't really hit the mainstream media yet of prices declining or homes sitting on the market longer so sometimes people aren't paying attention yeah, yeah exactly so sometimes sellers will call us you know in the past couple of weeks and say you know i know the market's on fire so i need a, a crazy price for my home yeah. so they haven't really adjusted yet and i think once so they you do, tell them you know the market's actually not on fire yeah. anymore <laughs> and they don't believe us yeah, all the time. yeah. And we try not yeah. to, to like argue yeah. with them right because oh, i feel okay. like it goes nowhere that's so true it's really just you know try and understand okay your price expectations are really high but do you have any motivation right so you're continuing to screen them rather than yeah. trying to prove a point to them so they say they say they want you know hundred thousand dollars more than you think it should be but you just you keep the conversation going and try and assess okay yeah can you tell me why you're selling and try and dig into that yeah or we'll say you know how did you come up with that price yeah. right and they'll yeah. say well my neighbor sold for nine hundred thousand okay. and we'll say okay is it the same house as yours oh well theirs was fully renovated mine needs a full renovation okay, okay so you know given the difference in condition yeah. now what would you be thinking for at, as a price right yeah. or you know if they still stay firm it's like okay you know why not list it then right like mm -hmm. i might not be your best option it sounds like we're going to be far below um, maybe it's better to list it and if mm -hmm. they say yeah i'll list it then we know it wasn't a lead for yeah. us right it wasn't the right lead if they pull themselves back in and say well no you know because of xyz i can't list it then yeah. you know, there might be something there yeah i love that you just keep pushing them away a you little bit so yeah. they, come, they back. come back yeah yeah, yeah. And then you know like yeah. are, you just, are you do you mean this or do you, yeah. you know okay what do you guys think about kind of monetizing the, the realtor leads sort of like if they say they want a list yeah, yeah. do you you know would so, you say you're a partner could yeah our partner's an agent but now yeah. he's focused mainly on construction yeah we used to pass off all those realtor leads to him and we yeah. would we would actually you know close some of those list them mm -hmm. you know get the commission um but now we pass them off to uh to his team okay so, so you are still monetizing so yeah we, we push them if they want to go the listing roof they're not best suited for us yeah. we'll monetize it we'll say yeah. you're best off listing i you know we have a great realtor that i think you should you should speak to Okay, and they're receptive to that? Because I, I tried that time. with the leads I had, and they were, they were just like, no. Nah. <laughs> just like anything, it's a numbers yeah. game, right? Yeah. You gotta, we go through so many leads that you know, yeah. a small, small percentage of them will come through. Yeah, a small percentage will yeah. still, yeah. yeah. It's just nice if you have that back end that you can say, hey, well, at least we didn't waste those marketing dollars. We'll get a little bit of something. Exactly. Out of it. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Very cool. So as far as your own portfolio, where are you guys focused in building? So we started with... Uh, so we just started purchasing rentals last year for the first two years that we were in business we were sticking to wholesaling and flipping just mm -hmm. to kind of raise the capital re-inject it into the business into the marketing starting last year we looked at um, welland and sudbury mm -hmm. as two areas to kind of start that rental portfolio because um at that point and, and you know in some neighborhoods still now you're, we were buying at or below the cost to build um you know price to to rent ratio was pretty good so we started with those two markets and then now we've added a few i'd say less cash flow um properties but they were at or close to perfect burrs so okay. one in hamilton one in barry mm -hmm. things like that and one in kitchener too yeah, yeah. okay so you're these are generated leads from your off-market efforts yeah. yeah that's why you're just getting great buys yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we stopped we stopped no buying flow. on mls after yeah. our, our oshawa flip <laughs> yeah. we we vowed to pretty much not buy on mls anymore so it was all just off it's all off leads. market yeah, yeah. And obviously you're getting like what would you say you're typically buying below like what it would go for if it was listed ah, it varies, it varies yeah say, we get some good deals yeah there's properties that we've we bought a property that where you know the profit was only maybe 10 15k but it was such an easy rental that it was worth it yeah and then there's properties that we're buying that you know could be 100 or 200 thousand below market mm -hmm. okay so yeah, so two, if it's 200, would that be like a $600,000 purchase that's 200 below market? Like it's an $800,000 home that you're getting for six? Or yeah, 700 that you're buying for five. Okay. But those are rare. Do you, would would you do those as like a wholesale or would you still wholesale them? So um, the way we look at it is first, does it fit our rental portfolio? Mm -hmm. Because we find it's hard to, you know, find properties that cash flow that'd be good burrs and that are in the markets that we're already in. Mm -hmm. So first criteria is, is it a good rental for us? If it is, then we'll keep it. Doesn't okay. matter, yeah. um, you know, how big the profit is. Okay. And then from there, we'll look at, you know, should we flip it or should we wholesale it? Right. And the way we look at that is a few things. Number one being, now that we're you know mm -hmm. using our own construction team yeah um the first thing is keep capacity right yeah. do we need something to keep them busy or are we too busy that it's better to, to yeah. assign it and then from there the last step is you know sometimes some properties like 
like you mentioned, wholesales, um, we find that we don't get as good of offers on the wholesale side for those. So it could be like a, a 60, 70 K profit, but because it doesn't look like a fixer upper, yeah. um, you know, people just don't, it doesn't, it's not as competitive. Even if you tell them it's below market. They, yeah. They <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's crazy. Yes. We did just maybe to give an example, we did one in Bramford. It was a semi where the seller had done, I'd say 90% of the rental and the remaining material was on yeah. site just to finish the rental. All you had to do was install some trim yeah. and paint. And we sent it out. Uh, I think we sent it out for 300. We, yeah. we had it under contract for 290, sent it out at 300. So just a 10K fee, nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm. We ended up making, I think 65 or 70,000 on it just as a whole tail. And yeah, it took so a week of work. So you closed it, just closed finished it, up yeah. the renovations and listed on MLS or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was about to say like that, I was just thinking you find some of these fixer uppers that you don't want to do or you don't have capacity mm -hmm. and just, and just hold just, them, yeah. Just yeah. put it on, on realtor.ca, like yeah. just because somebody's going to buy it. Well, I mean, in the market three months ago, somebody was definitely going to yeah. buy it, right? So that's nice. Like if you're at capacity, you can just, you know, it's not quite as profitable, but just do that. But then maybe sometimes it is like there's lots of people that are willing to pay too much for something that needs work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we get assignment fees that are, you know, somewhat bigger than what we were actually going to project if in you, terms of flipping. It, right? it, so yeah. we're like, we were more inclined to take the assignment yeah. fee. Really? You can get assignment yeah. fees that big. What's, What's your biggest assignment fee ever? <laughs> uh, it actually it? just closed on last Friday. It was 155 K. That's all right. Yeah. Not bad for, I mean, obviously you put all the systems in place, yeah. but not bad for a day's work, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, not too bad. <laughs> Lots when of commissions got paid though for that. <laughs> no, no, of course, right? Yeah, they obviously have to have to keep the system running and the people sending you. So you get people sending you leads as well, I guess. Uh, no, when I say commissions, I mean commissions to the team. Okay, so yeah, you're Because they're all on a you know salary plus commission type structure. Okay, that's nice. That's probably a critical thing to keep people engaged. Yeah. yeah. And I guess not your carpenters or your carpenters are on, on no, that No, no, carpenters are just on a hourly, yeah, hourly wage. It's, it's they're kind of like a separate business almost. So, so they don't even know the uh, the other side of your no, business? No, they don't, they don't really, I don't think they've ever interacted with any of the, the sales yeah. team. What's the uh, company called, by the way? Um, SLG Homebuyer is our seller's yeah. um, facing website. We have SLG Capital, which is kind of, uh, kind of us, the main brand. And yeah. then we have SLG Property Deals, which is for the buyers. Okay. For the, nice. uh, the assignments. Okay, and then on the uh, topic of capital, what is your strategy for financing the stuff that you buy? Are you guys raising like private mortgages? Is it all institutional? Is it all money you brought in? Um, or do you have like, you know, peanut lenders and what have you? Yeah, so typically uh, when we close on something, we'll close on it with private funds. Either mm -hmm. we have a few um, individual private lenders that we have good relationships with, or we'll use Calvert, which you probably heard of. A lot of investors use them. Um, really easy to work with. Calvert? Calvert. Calvert, yeah, Calvert. mortgage. Yeah. Huh, no, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. A lot know, of the wholesalers are, are pushing them now. So if you look at the the wholesalers, um, yeah, the, okay. the links they that they send it, out, they'll yeah. promote it at the bottom. Yeah, probably because they they're used to seeing the assignment fees and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they'll finance the full thing, well, including you know, the assignment fee. Yeah. And their turnaround time is like less than a week. To, yeah, to no up, no appraisals to And they're them. they're not a broker, they're a lender. They're, they're yeah, a direct, direct lender, lender, yeah. Okay, and people they'll deal direct with with people like us or yeah. like me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one to yeah. know. Yeah, and we actually have a bit of a program with them too. We try to yeah. uh we encourage our buyers to use them. They get, you know, a discount if they okay. end up uh if we if we refer them over and they use them, yeah. they get a discount. What's it typically look like to borrow with them? Like if, if for your buyers who are buying, you know, your assignments and they want to renovate them, like what are they looking yeah. at if they, if they deal with Calvert? So I think the minimum you have to put down is 20K. 20K. And then at that, the rate's around, let's say 14, 15%. When we use them- I mean, 20% like, for 20,000. 20,000 down. That's it? That's it. But That's the, it. the rate's a little bit high. The rate's right? high for that, yeah. It's yeah. always a 2% lender fee. Yeah. And then if you put 25% down, so that's the opposite end of the spectrum, that's now 8.49%. Okay. So not too bad. So what's the percentage if you do the, uh, do the just 20 K 20 K I think it's around 15, 15. Yeah. Okay. So a bit of a bit of a spectrum there. Yeah. It's still 2% lender fee on either. Yes. Either way. I hate those lender fees. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> where actually, all the, the costs They're very is. annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just dealing with this right now. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a lot better to just pay the simple interest on what you borrow. But I mean, yeah. of course, then you got to have your, your network of lenders that, that kind of just lend to you and, yeah. and work that out. But 
I've noticed like a lot of lenders that are in that business, they're actually selling it to their group of investors mm. and they're not marking up the fee. So they're the way they pay, get paid is the lender fee. So it's kind of mm. like paying a broker, but not like it's an yeah. institution. Yeah. So uh, interesting the things you kind of learn when you're just around this industry. But yeah. um, okay, so what's uh, what are you guys excited about right now? Like as far as business goes, investing goes. Uh, so we have a couple of unique projects, or you know, unique for us because we haven't really ventured um, into that level of construction. So like I said, the the coach house on uh, in Barrie. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. And then we also, we purchased a property in Welland. Um, it was a duplex with a, it was a double lot. Mm -hmm. So it didn't even have to be severed. It was actually two separate lots just on the same pin. Mm -hmm. So it was a quick, um, quick transaction with the city just to split the pins. Now we have an empty lot and we just submitted for minor variances to build a triplex there. Okay. So we're pretty, pretty excited about that. You know, yeah, first awesome. build from scratch. Okay. And are you are gonna manage the build yourself and just hire all the subcontractors? We're gonna try. Yeah, we're gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So that's well end, you said. That's well, well end. Yeah. yeah. So you just have to yeah, start with your your excavator. Yeah. <laughs> Work your way through. I guess you could start with your surveyor. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that sounds like a fun fun project. So um, sounds like you've got you know a good number of people in, internally that can still help you with that, right? You still use your your guys to do a lot of the work in there. Yeah, probably a lot yeah. of the finishing work. But the I feel like work. for the the major yeah. parts, we'll probably have to sub out yeah. a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ideally, and this I find this is kind of rare, but you find, uh, I have an excavator that, so they, they do the pinning inside the hole for like the survey. Uh, so like to actually locate the foundation. They excavate the hole. They, uh, like I said, they pin in the hole. They do the foundation. They backfill. They extend the services in, into the house. Like to have that all done under one operation is actually pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, usually in the past, I've had to hire a separate uh, excavator and forming crew, and then you have to like manage the relationship. It's uh, a lot more challenging. So if you can find that, see yeah. if you can find one that'll just do it all. It's so much better. And then you got a foundation. You get you know somebody to put up some sticks. Now it looks like a house. You, you know where to do, you know what to do from yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> once it's you know, yeah. once you have the shell, I think then go figure. Yeah. It out. Then it just yeah. seems really easy at <laughs> yeah. that point, right? So uh, yeah, construction is fun sometimes. So anyways, you guys will have fun with that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me know if you uh, if you need to pick my brain on it. For sure. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So where do people find you? Uh, so they can find us on our buyers list at uh, SLG Property Deals uh, mm -hmm. .ca, or they can find us on uh, Instagram at SLG Capital. SLG Capital. Okay. Yeah, I'll put those links in the uh, in the description below the video and on the show notes, so people can find you there. And uh, any final uh, parting words of wisdom for our listeners, viewers in these interesting times? Do you have anything? anything? Um, I would just say, you know, one of the things that, that we kind of saw as a challenge, uh, just in the, in the real estate industry in general, like there's so many different aspects, so many different things you can do. Um, you know, there's short-term rentals, wholesaling, flipping, re uh, rentals, multis, building. It's kind of like we figured, you know, let's start with something grow that and you know mm -hmm. just kind of have the blinders on and focus on on one thing at a mm -hmm. time and that's you know something i think has served us well and and i would highly recommend it yeah stay focused no yeah. no shiny objects and, yeah you know, it's easy it to get distracted it doesn't make sense to go into something you haven't done when you already have something that works that you just need to like find um i think yeah do you think that works for area too like stay focused on one area that you're you're investing in um, so i think i think if you're buying on mls yes yeah Right. Because um, let's say you let's say you live in, you know, Kitchener and you just want to buy in Kitchener and you know the market so well, you know, you tap into yeah. different realtors, different wholesalers. But I think when you're finding the private deals yourself and you're spending this money on marketing, you don't want to limit yourself to one yeah. area. No, yeah, fair enough. I, especially for you guys, like you, you get a deal, you get a deal. Yeah, it just yeah. means everywhere you, you own rentals, it means you have to set up yeah, systems yeah, and teams, exactly. right? Yeah. That's where I know Matt Pichet will say, you oh, know, don't do that. But yeah. you know, now he's investing in Florida. He's going to set up a separate set of teams, right? Yeah. It's obviously, you know, setting up your own like teams that are, yeah. that's going to be your biggest challenge. I've always not liked that, but I think eventually like it's part of growth, right? You're going to, sure. but maybe not your first, you know, when you're yeah. starting out, maybe, maybe focus on wherever you get your first wholesale deal exactly. yeah. and grow there and a little bit. Yeah. 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 Once yeah. you do it once, you can replicate it. But yeah. if, I would think if you're trying to do it in different cities right off the bat, it might be mm -hmm. a bit of a challenge. Yeah. If you're driving back and forth, yeah. like that, that kind of thing, that, that'll get taxing quite quickly. 
Anywho. Okay, guys, this was uh, great. Really nice to meet you face to face. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you guys do over the next year or two. Awesome. Thanks for having us, Andrew. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. I'll see you on the next one.